I thought in the spirit of Grand Rounds, I had to start with a couple of case presentations. First is case number one is a 10-year-old male with uh, a history of a fever and seizure at the age of 11 months who was diagnosed with herpes simplex encephalitis. Age 14 months and three years, developed fever and coma and again was diagnosed with HSV. And then from age three to 10 years, had no major illnesses. His workup was notable for low interferon alpha in his CSF and in his serum, and his, in serum levels and notably had no other history of viral illnesses. So the questions that arise with this are, is there a known genetic defect? What tests might be available now or in the future? What treatment might be available now or in the future? What is new in this area? And then if it wasn't HSV, but if it was a different microbe, would it lead to thinking about different genes? Second case is the other end of the spectrum from the adult world. It's a very common presentation, 50-year-old female with fever, cough, shortness of breath for two days, and is diagnosed with pneumonia on chest x-ray. And the common treatment decision that faces the clinician is, have seen in the ER, should you treat this patient at home because they appear clinically stable? Are they unstable, should be hospitalized, given intravenous antibiotics? Or are they so unstable with septic physiology that they should be treated in the intensive care unit? Factors that go in currently are comorbid conditions, do they have HIV or some immunosuppressed state? What's their clinical status? And currently, there's really no attention paid to clinical uh, to genetic profile, and so a question to, to discuss today is, is, is that coming in the future? And then, in more particular, this talk will focus on innate immunity, and are there innate immunity variants that could be associated with host susceptibility? So what I'd like to discuss today, uh, framing around these two cases, is first to describe an update on recent advances in innate immunity and to focus on three receptor families, the toll-like receptors, nod-like receptors, and rig-like receptors, and try to cover the last 10 years in, in, in just a short 10-minute overview. Second is then turn to the genetics of these receptor families and look at, on the one end of the spectrum, the, the Mendelian disorders, the primary immunodeficiency disorders, and then the other end of the spectrum, the adult presentations of these so-called common or complex immunodeficiencies and try to see where we are in terms of innate immunity variation and disease susceptibility. And then lastly, to turn to uh, clinical applications and what, what's available in terms of innate immunity advances with vaccines, immunomodulatory therapy, and then finally, whether there's any uh, potential for personalized medicine. So just as an a overview, of where, uh, where does the uh, idea come that genetics uh, is influential? This is just one of those bird's eye views of the role of genetics and in infectious disease susceptibility. This was an adoption study many years ago looking at premature mortality before the age of 50 and looking at adoptees and comparing their risk to their biologic uh, parent. Let me see if I can get this biologic parent or their adopted parent as surrogates for a genetic susceptibility or environmental susceptibility. And if you look at the relative risk for infection, you can see that the relative risk is 5.8 versus 0 0.73 in, in favoring the genetic column. And in contrast, if you look at cancer, it's the exact opposite. So it's a bird's eye view that genetics matter. And there's many, many lines of evidence with specific diseases, and we'll, we'll touch on that a little bit later. But I think one idea that, that often uh, is a stumbling block to believing there can be clinical relevance and there can be a role for diagnostic tests is, is, a, is a couple of obstacles with our current uh, models of the innate immune system. And one is that it's, they're not, it's not specific. If we're trying to answer the question, does variation or genetic control of the innate immune system matter in terms of infectious disease susceptibility? The first obstacle is that it's so nonspecific that it can't matter, that all pathogens are seen equally. And the real fine-tuned specificity of the immune system comes in the B and T cells, and that there can't be clinically relevant if everything's seen equally. Second obstacle is the uh, idea that there's just an inordinate amount of redundancy, and it's, it kind of comes down to these signaling nightmares that are present in immunology courses, kind of the equivalent of the biochemical pathway nightmares of the Krebs cycle. And if you consider that there's over 100 chemokines and cytokines, how in the world could there be clinical relevance if, uh, if there's so much redundancy in the immune system? And then the third obstacle to uh, believing there could be clinical relevance is that there, well, there have not to date been any clinical applications. And each of these three obstacles we're making a lot of headway on. Uh, it, 
I, I would still, um, I wouldn't argue too much that there are signaling nightmares, but within those enormous complexity of redundancy, there are specific stories starting to emerge and pathways emerging that can be modulated and understood, and there's now specificity within the redundancy that, that is beginning to emerge. And then the clinical applications, there actually are now starting to be clinical applications. So I'd like to take each of those three areas and, and describe over the next uh, 40 minutes or so how uh, each of those is, is, is only partially an obstacle at this point. So as a way of a brief overview, uh, just to, to, to be clear on terminology, the, the focus of this talk is to really understand advances in innate immunity, but it's very helpful to contrast it with adaptive immunity in terms of models and thinking. So innate immunity generally is thought of as, as uh, immunity that focuses uh, at, at different levels. F first, the cells are different. It's either a mixture of, of the complement system with, with circulating proteins, epithelial cells or phagocytes, as opposed to T cells and B cells, which are the hallmark of adaptive immunity. And then dendritic cells are more of an innate cell, but interfacing with the adaptive response. In general, the innate system is, is very quick it doesn't have memory, it's germline encoded, and there's limited specificity and limited variation. And each of those things are in, in marked contract, contrast the adaptive system. The hallmark of adaptive immunity is memory, and it's achieved through recombination of T cell receptors and, and immunoglobulin uh, in the B cells to give an extraordinary amount of variation. So very clearly these are different, and in, for, for decades, it's really been recognized that B cells and T cells are, are, are really the, the, the workhorses of exquisite specificity in the immune system. But I do like to, um, to point out disclosures in a talk like this, and that with the dominance of T cells over the years, I like to, to view the T cell pictures in books with a big, plump, healthy T cell and just a scrawny little dendritic cell, scrawny little macrophage that's interacting with the T cell and clearly the important cell in this slide is the T cell. And I like to view that as the 20th century view. I like to move us to the 21st century and give proper attention to the macrophages and dendritic cells, which are uh, uh, quite important. And, and not to argue, it, uh, joking aside, that T cells and B cells aren't incredibly important, but the really exciting thing in the last 10 years has been that there, there has been a new understanding of, of specificity and molecular understanding of the innate system. So that really, um, hones in on three receptor families. The, the bulk of the work's been done on the toll-like receptors, the TLRs, and then more recently there's been work on the nod-like receptors and then a little bit of work on the rig-like receptors. And these three receptors, the reason there's been so much interest and excitement in them is that they brought specificity to the whole event of pathogen recognition. They tie pathogen recognition to signaling, and then they lead to orchestrating and regulating the early inflammatory cascade. So toll-like receptors were actually discovered first in Drosophila in 1996, and it was, it was a, a typical Drosophila screen and, and, and picked out a gene called toll. And in that screen, they found that a, a toll-deficient fly uh, was susceptible to a fungal infection. This is a Drosophila that's coated with, with aspergillus and has died from a fungal infection. A couple years later, the homolog or, or orth orthologue for toll was found in humans and, and other mammalian species, and, and hence the, the, the term toll-like receptor. The excitement became quite apparent in terms of their potential importance because of this tethering of two major domains in the, in the protein. The first is this extracellular domain that is a leucine-rich region that binds pathogen molecules. It's a type 1 transmembrane protein, and then the intracellular signaling domain, or a so-called tier domain, a toll IL-1-like receptor domain, is involved with transmitting the signaling event to a signaling cascade. The extracellular domain differs amongst the, the 10 human family members. There's, uh, different species have different members, but the, 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 the more um, advanced mammalian species have roughly 10, mice have 13. Uh, interestingly, sea urchins have over 200 toll-like receptors, and they lack an adaptive immune system. So there's an evolutionary space in which toll-like receptors uh, needed even broader specificity for systems that don't have uh, adaptive immune responses. <coughs> the excitement in humans became apparent because the, the ligands for these uh, 10 toll-like receptors are different components of bacterial uh, uh, and viral particles. 
So in the case of toll-like receptors 1, 2, and 6, they, represent, they, they recognize small lipopeptides that are present in the cell wall of gram-positive and gram-negative organisms. LPS is seen by toll-like receptor 4, flagellin by toll 5, and then the nucleic acid sensors are tolls 3, 7, 8, 9 that recognize double-stranded RNA or single-stranded RNA. And then finally, um, uh, 9 recognizes uh, CPG DNA, uh, certain motifs of DNA that are overrepresented in bacteria. Just as one example, here is, is a macrophage recognizing flagellin, uh, which is uh, coated pink here, and this E. coli uh, uh, bug being uh, in, engaged by the macrophage. So after recognition at the surface, there's then the signaling cascade that involves adapter proteins, these four adapter proteins, and then a whole host of molecules that culminates in NF-kappa-B translocation or other transcription factor activation and activation of cytokine and chemokine production. So there's several levels of specificity to the TLR cascade. The first is that there is a compartmentalization of the response. And this, this occurs, uh, many of the tolls are expressed at the surface. Uh, all of them are membrane bound. And for the surface molecules, as a as a pathogen is ingested in phagocytosed, the TLRs ring the phagocytic vacuole. As shown here, this is TLR2 stained in green, ingesting a particle. And there you see enrichment of TLR2 on the phagocytic cups surrounding the pathogen. And so the TLRs are sampling the phagosome and trying to distinguish self from non-self, which is really the dominant first thing that a TLR does, is it helps with dis distinguishing whether this is something that should be reacted to with an inflammatory cascade. There's several levels of regulation of the TLRs. The first is that TLRs can cooperate with a handful of other receptors, shown here as Dectin-1, where TLR2, TLR6, and Dectin-1 all cooperate to recognize zymazan, which is a model yeast particle. So there's a little bit of additional breadth of specificity when TLRs pair with other receptors. And then the second or additional level of specificity or uh, of, of ability to uh, regulate the pathway occurs with the adapter molecules, mighty 88 TRAP, TRIF, and TRAM, they can work with the different TLRs in different combinations, so you don't get the identical response with each toll-like receptor that's activated from the outside, that you have different responses, and, and that will get, become important later, looking at clinical applications that you can actually stimulate different pathways preferentially. Another regulatory role uh, level is expression of the TLRs. And here's an example on dendritic cells where myeloid dendritic cells express primarily tolls 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, where plasma cytoid cells make 7, 8, and 9. They use different adapters, uh, as shown in the previous slide. And then the, the outcome is that myeloid cells make a lot of different cytokines, but plasma cytoid DCs are predominantly makers of interferon alpha and beta. So at the cellular level, the ability for a cell to predominantly make one type of inflammatory response is partially regulated by the TLRs. So that specificity and regulation is, is, is controlled with all these different mechanisms that were just enumerated. So that encapsulates the initial part of the inflammatory cascade at the innate level. The, the, the next level is with the interaction with the adaptive immune response. Although this is clearly innate, the interactions through dendritic cells with the adaptive immune response enables the TLRs to shape the adaptive immune response. The, the clearest way this happens is that dendritic cells need to be activated to interact with T cells and to present antigen and activate T cells. And they do that either through secretion of cytokines in a um, in a, during the engagement of the T-cell receptor, um, as well as the maturation of the dendritic cell from an immature to a mature dendritic cell with upregulation of co-stimulatory molecules such as CD80 and CD86. So if you are unable to mature a dendritic cell, then you will have a weaker adaptive immune response, and maturation of dendritic cells can be achieved by direct stimulation of TLRs. And that gets back to pathogens can do that, and then also vaccines can do it through adjuvants. And we'll return to that in the third section about uh, clinical applications. So the bulk of work over the last 10 years has been on TLRs. And I just want to touch briefly on these other two innate immune families, NLRs and RLRs. So the NLRs, the nod-like receptors, they've had a lot of different names, and it's been very confusing for nomenclature. But uh, those various names um, 
constitute a family of about 22 to 25 proteins. And the key thing is that NLRs sit in the cytoplasm. TLRs are on membranes, either the surface or on organelles within the cell, and NLRs are in the cytoplasm. So you, you are able to have two different sampling mechanisms for a cell that's trying to detect microbes. If you have a microbe that predominantly lives in the cytoplasm, it would potentially um, escape some of the detection mechanisms of the TLRs. And so the NLRs are serving a different topologic compartment of the cell. They are not as well defined in terms of ligands. Uh, a couple of the ligands have been defined, in um, particular NOD1 and NOD2 also recognize uh, components of bacterial cell walls, uh, MDP and then a molecule called mesodap. But the majority of the 25 or so members do not have known ligands. Uh, there is one NALP3 that we'll return to later that has a variety of ligands that have been defined and the thing to note about that is that it regulates a different inflammatory cascade, uh, which is a caspase one dependent cascade in which pro-IL-1 beta is cleaved to form IL-1 beta and IL-18. And that uh, will, uh, will be another area where there's a clinical application that, that potentially could emerge over the next uh, 10 years or so. so the different pathways, although they're all detecting and elaborating inflammatory cascades, there is specificity within these cascades that, that within that cytokine, chemokine redundancy, there are ways in which uh, different pathways are being accentuated with different receptors. Just one slide on the third family, the RLLs, the rig-like receptors. There's a, a handful of members, there's three members, and they're primarily involved with viral detection. And there, there have been some nice studies on them, but they, they, have, they have not been studied as intensively to date. But they, 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 they clearly have an important role in viral detection. So this first section comes together uh, with these three receptor families have catapulted the world of innate immunity to a molecularly defined level of pathogen recognition and signaling cascade regulation. And it all begins with the recognition of the pathogens by either macrophages, dendritic cells, or epithelial cells, and then the elaboration of three critical components of an immune response. The first is the inflammatory cascade, the cytokines and chemokines. The second is the adaptive interface with the T cells and B cells. And then the third is microbial killing mechanisms with elaboration of, of reactive oxygen and nitrogen intermediates. So the, the innate system really sits at the center of all this. And although it doesn't have the specificity and fine-tuned memory of, an, of T cell and a B cell response, it's so central and so early in the response that it's, it's a really a key orchestrator of all the events that ensue after that. So that leads to the second part of this discussion, which is what happens when you genetically vary the innate immune response? And does it matter clinically? And, and gets at the heart of that second clinical obstacle, which is if you vary the innate immune response, and there's so much redundancy in the innate immune response, can it actually matter? Can it have clinical implications? Or is the redundancy overly present and it won't matter? So this, this question can get encapsulized is, is, is for each of these infections with the two cases uh, uh, encapsulating up front, why do infections affect individuals differently? And this question arises all the time in the world of infectious disease. Sometimes there is overt problems such as HIV or, or diabetes or uh, neutropenia from cancer chemotherapy, but many times there's not. Why do people have different susceptibility to infection? Clearly, there's uh, different possibilities besides the overt immunosuppression that could be present in a host, which would be the external factors down here in the lower third of the triangle. Pathogens can have different virulence factors. Uh, but the third arm is what about host genetics? And host genetics really come in two major flavors. The first would be the Mendelian disorders or single gene defects or the so-called primary immunodeficiencies. And then the second would be the common immunodeficiencies. And they're, they're very different. The first Mendelian disorders, so monogenic, single gene, high penetrance. If you have the mutation, and it's usually a mutation because it knocks out function of the gene, it's highly penetrant. You're very likely to see a clinical phenotype. But usually they're rare. They present early, severe, and, 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 and mutations. All of those features are different for the, for the other column. Uh, so these are considered polygenic disorders on the right. They're common in that you know, many people in society might get pneumonia, might get tuberculosis, and the inheritance patterns uh, are usually multiple genes, and it's usually polymorphisms as opposed to mutations. They're usually af subtly affecting the function of a gene rather than overtly uh, knocking it out. 
And usually the frequency of the polymorphisms is much more common, but very low penetrance for any given signal allele. Uh, and the features are generally more mild. And the variable, the age of onset is much more variable, not only seen in the, in the very young. This latter type of genetic variation is, is most uh, clearly uh, attached to single nucleotide polymorphisms, which are, uh, by definition, variation at the base pair level that occurs in more than 1% of the population. So in, within the human genome of 3 billion bases, there's an enormous number of polymorphisms. And the, the key question in this, in this field has been to try and understand if these polymorphisms affect cell function and whether they're, they're truly associated with disease. So I'd like to first give some very clear examples of the Mendelian disorders that I think really set the stage for some, some clear understandings of when you knock out a component of the toll-like receptor pathway, you can have a clinical phenotype, and then move to the grayer, more vague area of the common polymorphisms and, and some of the challenges, some of the interest and intriguing findings, but some of the challenges of showing the, the relevance of common polymorphisms. So at the Mendelian side, um, this is a case similar to the first case, which we'll return to uh, as well, but it's slightly different. Seven-year-old female born to consanguineous parents in the United States and had multiple very serious infections from very early ages. Skin, bone, uh, septic arthritis, and, and the organisms found in most of these infections were extracellular organisms, Streptopneumo, Staph aureus, E. coli, Pseudomonas, Stenotrophomonas. And they occurred at many sites, but always extracellular organisms, gram-positives and gram-negatives. Interestingly, fever responses were minimal, and the condition then improved. So at about age four, this, this patient stopped having these infections. So how, does, how is this approached uh, from a clinical and a lab perspective? Well, traditionally, before getting to, to the genetic defect of this individual, the pathogens that one encounters in terms of these primary immunodeficiency workups usually get grouped into cellular, humoral, complement, and phagocytic defects. You can see some of the pathogens in each of those. The cellular defects are usually intracellular organisms such as salmonella in the world of bacteria uh, or some of the viral uh, causes. Um, it's not always obvious that they're, they're distinctly intracellular versus extracellular, but that's one of the themes. At the humoral level, with antibody-mediated immunity, you, you often see a lot of encapsulated organisms, such as uh, strep pneumo and haemophilus. Complement is very well known for deficiencies associated with Neisseria, also uh, an encapsulated organism. And then various phagocytic defects are often associated with a variety of bacteria as, as opposed to viruses. So you can get a clinical clue, and then you can look at the list of primary immunodeficiencies, and you can see them grouped by cell and by parts of the immune system. And for example, you can see that uh, the NADPH oxidase system associated with chronic granulomatous disease is often associated with extracellular bacteria. And then some of the T cell defects, you might get organisms such as pneumocystis, uh, and, and, and as mentioned previously, the complement system associated with Neisseria. One interesting uh, axis that that was discovered about 10 years ago was interferon gamma receptor IL-12 access. So IL-12 secreted by monocytes activates T cells to make interferon gamma, um, and then the interferon gamma acts, uh, uh, binds to the interferon gamma receptor back on the monocyte to activate it to kill the bug. And there's been a strong association of, these, of defects in each of those three genes, interferon gamma receptor IL-12 and IL-12 receptor, with salmonella and mycobacterial infections. So you can get clues. Uh, actually, uh, this slide encapsulates uh, that, that pathway there. Here's the, the monocyte making IL-12, binding to the T cell through the receptor. T cell makes interferon gamma and then activates the macrophage to, to kill the bug, which is, in this case, uh, has been associated with mycobacterium salmonella. Elegant studies, uh, these are all mutations, are all single gene disorders, and are all considered Mendelian disorders. So a typical lab workup for a primary immunodeficiency would involve uh, doing some broad surveys for T-cell defects, getting a complete blood count, doing flow cytometry for lymphocyte subsets, maybe some T-cell proliferation assays, measuring immunoglobulin levels, immunoglobulin subclasses. Sometimes they'll then move to a more functional stage of vaccinating the individual and seeing whether they respond to vaccination measuring complement levels, and then doing an oxidative burst or MBT test uh, with phagocyte assays. So 
that's been kind of the traditional repertoire with, with a few other things, but that's kind of the starting traditional repertoire of a primary immunodeficiency workup. Um, in this case, all of those studies were done, and they were essentially normal. There was a high IgE level noted, but uh, not, uh, this patient did not have the classical features of, of a known syndrome, hyper-IgE syndrome. And the, this initial workup led to uh, really no insight into what defect this, this child had. So the investigators then went on and they took toll-like receptor ligands and they stimulated the PBMCs of, of the cells of this child. And it's a little bit small on the type here, but as shown here on the x-axis are a variety of TLR ligands. And as you can see, in the white open bars are controls, and the black bars, which are baseline, are the cytokine uh, levels, and in this case, TNF. And as you can see, they're essentially absent. Um, present on the right-hand side are whole bugs, so a whole complex mixture of all the ligands present in a whole bug, and similarly, minimal to no cytokines being produced by the cells of this individual. And it turns out that this child has a mutation in IRAC4. So IRAC4 is, sits here in the TLR pathway, and by knocking out IRAC4, you basically eliminate the signaling from all 10 of the toll-like receptors. There's a slight exception to that, but, but you're essentially knocking out almost the entire pathway. A later study published last year by the same group found that a, a, a similar mutation in MITE88 essentially uh, is associated with the same clinical phenotype. And then other studies have shown two other genes in the pathway, uh, IKK gamma, also called NEMO, and IKappa B, are also associated with severe primary immunodeficiencies. Slightly different organisms in clinical presentation, but all four of those proteins have been found in these rare primary immunodeficiencies. So very clear demonstration that if you knock out a, a key member, a key part of the TLR pathway, you can have a profound clinical phenotype. Now back to the first case with HSV encephalitis, uh, just to remember that the pertinent features here are HSV then got better and had no other viral illnesses. So this ended up being, um, there's, there's now been two different mutations in the TLR pathway that have been mapped. The first is UNC93B and the second is toll-like receptor 3. Similar case uh, as, as the IRAC4, uh, but, but, but some notable differences. First is that there's a profound defect in signaling, but in this case, it's more selective. It's the toll 3, 7, 8, 9 signaling. Shown here in too small type are the ligands for tolls 3, 7, 8, and 9. And there was defects in, in, in those uh, ligands, but the other TLR ligands, the signaling was preserved. And shown on the right, uh, is, is similarly, poly-IC is the ligand for toll receptor 3. The patient is in black and the control is in white, and you can see the, 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 the defect in signaling. So in this case, the, the main output is interferon alpha, as opposed to the other, which was TNF alpha. So different cytokines, different tolls, and different pathogens. Herpes, a virus on the one hand, and extracellular bacteria on the other hand. Just to place these in the pathway, tolls 3, 7, 8, 9 are sit on the endosome intracellularly, and they interact with UNC93B in a, in a, in a mechanism that's not entirely worked out, but UNC93B very, uh, has been mapped by other studies to be involved in that signaling pathway. And, and, and so there's a selective impairment of the, of the, of the TLR3, uh, 7, 8, 9 uh, interferon alpha signaling pathway that leads, most interestingly, to a very selective immunodeficiency to HSV. So not only is that child not getting extracellular bacterial pathogens or intracellular or, or frankly, any other bacterial pathogens, they're also not getting other viral pathogens. So the idea that a single gene can be associated with a single pathogen, uh, in this case HSV, is, is really a, a very striking observation that, that surprises me, that, that tells 3789 uh, given that they knock out interferon alpha signaling, I would have predicted that they would have been susceptible to an enormous number of viruses. Uh, and I think this really uh, creates a, a shift in paradigm thinking of, of, of how a receptor can be so specific for a, a disease. And back to those three obstacles at the beginning of the talk, the, although there is a, a real signaling nightmare when one looks at the immune system, 
if that kind of specificity can come out of a, a single cytokine interferon alpha can be tightly associated with a certain virus and then a, an innate immune receptor, it at least puts a layer of specificity on that enormous complexity. So this slide just summarizes some of those associations, some of those genes uh, with the prominent microbial phenotypes associated with those diseases. So I think the Mendelian world is a very good, clear example of where it matters. If you mutate these genes, you can get profound phenotypes. Now, it's much more complicated when you shift to the world of polymorphisms and the, the polygenic disorders and the complex inheritance. As an example, the lines of evidence of why people believe that there, there is a role for genetics in these, in these more complex disorders that affect all age groups and, and certainly involve lots of adults. Traditional lines of evidence uh, are just exemplified here with tuberculosis. It starts with twin studies. If you compare rates of tuberculosis in monozygotic and dizygotic twins, uh, you see a difference in, in those rates. You can do genome-wide scans and look for major loci. In the case of tuberculosis, uh, four of those have been identified in, in several studies. And then there's a, a lines of evidence with candidate gene studies, where you look at the single nucleotide polymorphisms, or SNPs, in these genes. And then you look for differences in frequency between cases and controls. Th these are it's a partial list of the genes that have been associated with tuberculosis, and they've been validated to different degrees. And the, 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 really the best degree of evidence is where you can see these associations occur in multiple cohorts, uh, in multiple ethnicities, and, and, and be heavily validated. So this is where a lot of the grayness comes in, is that some, uh, a lot of these associations don't get validated, but some of them do. And then the second piece is, do they have a, a strong link to functional consequences? So this really gets at the heart of case number two from the beginning, uh, which is, are there any polymorphisms that have been associated with pneumonia? And, and again, getting at the heart of these single nucleotide polymorphisms. So I just want to take three slides on, on work that I've been involved with. Uh, primarily, this talk is, has nothing to do with my work. But it just exemplifies this question and some evidence that there are genetic profiles associated with pneumonia. We've been studying Legionella, which is an important cause of pneumonia, and there's been some traditional risk factors that have been identified over the years, such as smoking, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, alcohol use, and then some immunosuppressed states, such as diabetes, but genetic profiles have not been part of the, uh, uh, the risk profile. Legionella is a gram-negative motile bug with a flagellum, and it lives with inside macrophages. Shown here, again, is that picture of, of, a, of a flagellar structure interacting with a macrophage being recognized by TOL5. So we investigated an outbreak of Legionnaire's disease in the Netherlands, where there was a kind of a classic outbreak. Legionella got spewed throughout the room from a, from a, a water cooling system, shown here in the red arrow. And the collaborators did a, a careful outbreak investigation and defined cases and controls. And the, the heart of our finding was that there was a stop codon polymorphism in Tolic receptor 5 that was present in 10% of the population. And if we took cells from people with this stop codon polymorphism, stimulate them with the ligand flagellin, we found that there was a profound decrease in the amount of IL-6 produced. So there's a functional consequence to having this polymorphism. 10% of the population walks around with an inability to sense flagellin normally. And it was associated with about a two-fold increased risk of getting Legionnaire's disease. So this is an example of a polymorphism that's quite common, but it actually has a, more of a mutation effect in terms of its function. And the question is, if you knock out just one part of your ability to see Legionella, you're still left with an ability to see it through other toll-like receptors. And so the partial phenotype uh, would, would be partially related to the fact that there is some redundancy in your ability to see Legionella. Um, the field as a whole has described uh, a handful of polymorphisms shown on this slide of the toll like receptor family that are present, again, at the common level. This is different than the Mendelian mutations just described. This is a separate list. And these polymorphisms all have some type of functional story associated with them, where if you study the variant of the gene either in a transfected cell system or primary cells, you can detect a functional defect. And then, as well, each of these polymorphisms have some level of evidence with susceptibility to infection. But it's not as tight, it's not as clean as the Mendelian world, but it's incredibly common, and the question is, how relevant will this be 
uh, over the years as we start to, to really understand which of these polymorphisms are the key ones and could that ever come to a state where we have clinical insight for the, for the physician sitting in the emergency room. That's clearly not known right now. There's a lot more uh, validation and functional work that needs to be done, but that the seeds are laid that there are functionally important polymorphisms that are showing some level of association with disease outcome, um, and the, the future is not known how important that'll be clinically. There's one other example of the common world that I think is really worth emphasizing uh, because of its importance and clarity, which is in the NLR family. NOD2 has been associated with Crohn's disease, and the level of evidence of this is very strong. These are, these are also common polymorphisms, and the, the particular polymorphisms slash mutations that have been found in NOD2 are thought to account for about 20 or about 15 percent of Crohn's disease or this, this autoimmune auto inflammatory disorder associated with the GI tract. These are studies that have been um, uh, worked out in multiple cohorts, and if you carry the high-risk allele, either one copy, you have an odds ratio of 2.4, or two copies, up here on the right, if I can get the pointer, um, an odds ratio of 17.1. So a profoundly high odds ratio if you carry the allele in terms of your risk of getting Crohn's disease. These are the mutations here in the leucine-rich region of NOD2, and they're all associated with decreased NF-kappa B production. There's a lot of hypotheses as to, to the mechanism of how this occurs because uh, you have a hypo-inflammatory molecular mutation leading to a hyper-inflammatory clinical syndrome. And depending on uh, what step in pathogenesis is primarily affected from colonization to invasion to downstream effects of altered signaling pathways, uh, there's various hypotheses as to how that unfolds at a pathogenesis level. But the genetic evidence, uh, which is, is, is partially shown here, is very, very strong for the association of NOD2 with Crohn's disease. Um, and it's really, I think, worth emphasizing that some of these associations, like NOD2 and Crohn's, are very, very strong, whereas others um, uh, are, are at a much lower level of evidence. So I just want to backtrack to this and emphasize that there's several other syndromes that have been associated with the NLR pathway. All of these on the right are immunodeficiency rare uh, Mendelian disorders, and we'll return to Cinca in the NALP3 gene uh, at the end of the talk. So multiple examples of where genetics matter, most clearly at the immunodeficiency Mendelian world level, but uh, more and more examples at the common world where genetics matter in terms of variation in the innate immune system. <clears throat> so. Let's now turn just to the, to the final topic, which is, does this matter clinically, and are there uh, applications of treatment that uh, any of this are, is leading to now or is going to lead to in the future? So I just want to cover three topics briefly. The first is the role of adjuvancy in vaccines. The second is immunomodulatory therapies. Can we use agonists of the TLR pathway to, to treat patients clinically? And then the third uh, is, is this final thought of, of Will we have a world with, with personalized medicine and genetics profi genetic profiles? So the, I think of the, of the three topics, the adjuvancy world is probably the clearest. Vaccines and TLR adjuvancy. So, so the history of, of adjuvants is actually it's quite interesting because uh, the main adjuvant we've had for all these years is alum. We've either had live vaccines or we've, if you've had an adjuvant, it's been alum. And no one's ever really known how alum works. It's been predominantly associated with a Th2 type response, that it's good at inducing antibodies, but not very good at inducing cell mediated immunity. Now, just this year, uh, it was discovered actually that, that alum works through NALP3. And, and, and the NALP3 connection uh, will, will, will emerge in a little bit. But the, the other exciting findings about 10 years ago, people started using, um, uh, developing. TOL4 agonists as adjuvants, and now more recently, TOL7 and 9 adjuvants. For many, many years in the, in the animal world, people have used Freund's adjuvant, which has the bacterial cell wall of, of mycobacteria. And that's always, that's been known for decades, uh, since the 1930s and 40s, to be a potent adjuvant. So the ability to stimulate, as an adjuvant, a robust adaptive immune response, there's a long history that this occurs primarily through activating the innate immune system. And now, in the last 10 years, the actual molecules involved in adjuvancy have been discovered. 
So um, in addition to just discovering that there is this, this role with molecular names to the receptors, there's now a lot of work on fine tuning which of those responses are developed. So the, if, you, if you stimulate different toll-like receptors, you can get different responses. For example, toll seven and nine are tightly associated with developing a type one cytokine response, T cell cytokine response, predominantly with interfering gamma. And then if you stimulate toll-like receptor two, there's a tendency to, to shift more to a Th2 type response. And then alum remains a more potent Th2 responding uh, induction through NALP3. So the idea that's starting to emerge is that we'll be able to fine tune the type of adjuvancy effect that, that's achieved. And some of the big diseases that have never had an effective vaccine, TB, malaria, HIV, it may be that these new generation adjuvants that are more molecularly specific would have potential to, uh, to, to actually elicit a, a qualitatively different response um, that can then can be more specifically engineered. So this, this, this slide down here was just giving a little bit of the data behind toll receptor 4, its use as an adjuvant in the hepatitis B vaccine. It's not FDA approved in the U.S. It is being used in Europe. And the, the slide just has a little bit of data showing an increase in antibody titer um, that can be achieved with toll receptor 4 adjuvancy. And then the second example is with toll receptor 9, um, and primarily working through um, the dendritic cells, to a uh, similar message that toll receptor 9 can give you a longer lasting and a higher titer of a protective immune response. So the world of adjuvancy is already being shaped and changed by the, the, the different innate immune receptors, and I, in the future of that, we'll get uh, more and more developed as more and more ligands and pathways are worked out. The second area <clears throat> is the ability to immunomodulate TLR pathways. And this idea of, of, well, are there any clinical applications or will there be? So there actually is one current use of a TLR drug and that is currently being used by, by many clinicians, and that's, it's, it's a drug called amiquimod, which is the, is the ligand for toll receptor 7. And it, it was actually marketed in the late 90s before it was known to be a toll receptor <laughs> ligand, and it's used for topical treatment of warts. So human papillomavirus causes uh, cutaneous warts, and it's a cream formulation, and it was known when it was first marketed that if you, uh, if you, uh, if you uh, put it on a wart, you'll get induction of a hyperinflammatory response. You'll see the skin get red, and then the wart will, uh, will, will fall off because the innate immune system has been activated. And so that is, um, it's, 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 it's the actual ligand for tolic receptor 7. The, the, the slide that follows that is a little bit more of a, a humbling slide that... <clears throat> says that despite all that elegance of, of actually having a specific toll -like receptor 7 agonist to, to use in the clinic, if you actually compare the data with the standard therapies for wart treatment, which is basically freezing it or putting salicylic acid on it, so a, a, just a caustic acid substance on a wart, that the efficacy rates of treatment are actually no different. And the, the treatment costs of, of amiquimod, is, as you might imagine, with its marketing by a pharmaceutical company as an on-patent drug, are, are quite expensive. And so um, although it's great for elegance, it really hasn't helped us achieve anything we couldn't do with a little bit of liquid nitrogen or, or a, a harsh acid. But I think it really demonstrates that, that we're in an age where hopefully there will be treatments developed that, that actually change what we can treat and do it with less side effects and more elegance and, and hopefully with, with things that, um, <clears throat> that, that are, have been previously untreatable. There is a slide here talking about amiquimod and other uses um, and includes a recent study in the New England Journal that looked at its treatment of, um, of neoplasia of the, of the cervix associated with, with HPV. Same idea, topical application leading to treatment of an HPV-induced cancer or neoplasia. So applications are happening, but, but it's really just starting to happen. The last couple slides um, return to the idea of NALP3 and the inflammasome, <clears throat> and they illustrate uh, what I think the future could hold, which is the ability to specifically modulate different innate immune pathways. The idea here starts with an observation in one of these Mendelian disorders, which is called NOMID or SINCA. Now, this disease has been mapped 
to mutations in NALP3. And there's actually a variety of them. The syndrome is notable for uh, first uh, having a, a very profound clinical phenotype. You get, you get a rash, you can get a conjunctivitis, but most importantly, you can get very severe inflammation of the brain, and these, these children die. It's been untreatable. Uh, the notable thing about the NALP3 pathway uh, in this slide, which is, which is identical to one of the earlier slides, is that NALP3 is involved with a caspase-1 dependent pathway where you get cleavage of pro-IL-1-beta to form IL-1-beta, and then IL-1-beta is secreted, and IL-1-beta is a pro-inflammatory cytokine. So now this NALP3-associated disorder, Synca or Noma, is associated with high IL-1-beta levels, and can be thought of, uh, if, if you could think of diseases as cytokine-specific at some level, this would be an IL-1-beta disease. And so there's a compound available, uh, Anakinra, which is a blocker of IL-1-beta, and it blocks the interaction of IL-1-beta with its receptor. If you treat these patients, and there's only 17 of them in this, in this paper, you completely can cure the disease. So despite a huge repertoire of ability of an innate immune system to, to either regulate and develop pro-inflammatory molecules, cytokines or chemokines, uh, this disease is associated with one, and blocking that one completely removes the pathology associated with that disease. So it's again another example of where there is some specificity and ability to treat within this sea of redundancy of the innate immune system. So that is a rare disease. It's, it's, it's great for the children it's involved with and it doesn't have a lot of impact at the population level. So the second last slide poses the possibility of how this could have impacted a greater level. And it, it, it's developed from uh, recent observations of I mean, the last couple of years where uric acid crystals have been shown to activate the immune system through NALP3. So if you take NALP3 knockout macrophages and you stimulate them with uric acid crystals, if you, if you, don't, if you have a normal macrophage, you can, you can produce IL-1-beta. But if you knock out NALP3, you can abolish IL-1-beta production. So uric acid is the hallmark of gout, uh, an inflammatory condition associated with arthritis, and can be quite debilitating in its severe forms. So there's some provocative new data, the small level, small trials, that if you use the same compound that blocks IL-1-beta, you can ameliorate the symptoms of gout. Very small trial, and I wouldn't want to oversell this, but it, to me, to me it, it begins to open up the landscape of a innate immune receptor associated with a common disease that is predominantly involved with production of, of, of a certain cytokine, IL-1-beta, that perhaps there'll be diseases like gout that are IL-1-beta diseases. There's diseases now that are thought of as TNF-alpha diseases, Crohn's, rheumatoid arthritis, psoriasis, where it's currently being used are TNF-alpha inhibitors, which are <coughs> also downstream of, of TLR and, and innate immune receptors. And so we have some TNF-alpha diseases, maybe there'll be IL-1 beta diseases, and it brings up the potential that we could selectively treat these downstream mediators, and then maybe with time, they'll be at the receptor level also able, at the toll-like receptor or the nod-like receptor level, be able to selectively block or stimulate those receptors and really see a play, uh, a back and forth of the rheumatologic world and the infectious disease world of trying to balance the benefits and the harms that these pathways can be involved with if there's too much or too little of them. So the last slide is uh, uh, progress and future prospects. <clears throat> so it lays out four areas. The first is pathogenesis. I think the hallmark of the last 10 years in innate immunity has been pathogenesis and, and a new molecular understanding of the innate immune response. And that's really what's catapulted all of these ideas onto the map. It's not that T cells and B cells are not incredibly important, but it's now the innate immune system is being understood at a level that has some molecular uh, clarity and the, the impact now is, is unfolding with, with, with much more precision. So that's happening. The second is what relevance does it have clinically? At the vaccine world, I think it's already happening in terms of adjuvants, and that's going to continue to happen. The real question is going to be how, how much does it fundamentally change what we can do with vaccines, and it's too early to say. So far, the examples are it's enhancing and boosting current vaccines and making them a little bit more robust 
a little bit longer lived. And the real question is whether it's going to lead to fundamentally new ways to vaccinate, and especially for diseases that we've not had vaccines up till date. The third is treatment. A few examples are out there, uh, such as amiquimod and, and HPV. And, and the real question is how many more uh, will be developed? And, and right now it's just early days. But I think there's great potential because of the selectivity of the ability to, to modulate. And then the last is personalized medicine, is really back to the ER with the physician treating someone with pneumonia and does the genetic profile matter. And it's very clear that that's not, the, not being done now and the data is not there to do that. And it's not clear what the future will hold for that, especially for such an acute care decision. Um, there, there are other examples in other areas of medicine where genetics are already influencing decision making, but that acute pace of infectious disease uh, decision making, uh, the, the world of common polymorphisms and SNPs, the associations are not strong enough, at least with, with the current uh, understanding we have now, to be impacting clinical medicine. And that may or may not unfold in a way that, that leads to impacting clinical care, uh, but it does seem to be at least shaping uh, the, uh, the, the ideas on pathogenesis. So um, that's the, the end, and I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you.